A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week. Well, one would think that if you're in your 20s and you can afford a $59 million wedding in Paris, you don't have a care in the world. That is unless the honeymoon is over and you're back in Texas and your new husband is accused of shooting at three cops knocking at your mansion door and is now facing 25 years in prison for aggravated assault. It is another case of the rich and privileged behaving badly. But first, a much more serious case in the state of Texas, a popular high school cheerleader who was scheduled to perform at the town Christmas parade has been murdered, found stabbed to death in the family's bathtub. Police announced that they've arrested a suspect who is reportedly a perfect stranger to the victim and her family. Could this have been a burglary gone wrong or the result of deliberate planning by a dangerous predator? We're recording this on Wednesday, December 13th of 2023, and our guest today is Dr. Nikki Jackson, a professor of criminal justice and the executive director for the Center for Justice and Post-Exoneration Assistance at Purdue University Northwest. Nikki is also a great friend of the show, a lovely human being, and my friend on Facebook. (laughs) How are you, Nikki? (laughs) I'm great, Anna. How are you? It's good to see you outside of social media, right? Absolutely. Always good to spend some time with you. I love your perspective on things. I know you're super busy. You just got back from um, a court hearing, so we are grateful to have you with us. Thanks for having me, as always. I appreciate being on the show. Absolutely. And, you know, we also want to say that you also have a lot of expertise in the area of domestic violence as well. Um, And uh, one of the questions I always ask when you have uh, a murder, like we're about to discuss out of Texas, is does someone just wake up one morning and commit such a violent crime? Of course, we don't always know all the details, but do you find, Nikki, that you know, there are those cases where someone just commits a murder, we don't know the circumstances here, or generally are there things in the person's background that lead them to that point? Well, that's a great question. So I I sit on two prison boards and I have interviewed prisoners for many, many years, many who are sitting in prison for murder. Um, Oftentimes they'll tell me that the crime was committed by because of opportunity. Um, You know, they hadn't planned on it that day, but the opportunity arose and they committed a crime and which ended up, you know, obviously resulting in a horrific murder. Um, I do believe that people can snap and um yeah i'm not really sure what happened you know exactly in this case um was from my understanding there was a a break-in in in the apartment um the week before and so there's questions on whether you know this led to um was this related that earlier break-in was it related to what happened to this young lady on that tragic day so Mm -hmm. to answer your question People can, you know, snap. Uh, I don't know enough about the case to to answer particularly about this, you know, on this case itself. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, depending on the jurisdiction, depending on the crime, we sometimes have a lot of details provided to us by police and authorities, and sometimes we don't. But we still believe in covering cases to um, provide a spotlight on some of these cases so they can get more attention, especially this first case, because This one occurred in a small town in Texas, population less than 6,000, the kind of place where they do have Christmas parades along Main Street and the entire town shows up. So this is a very shocking, shocking crime for this community and certainly one that every single person can identify with. The horror of a mother finding her daughter dead in a bathtub is just, it's horrific. It's beyond horrific. And I mean, my daughter was a cheerleader. I, you know, I'm a mother and it was very hard to, you know, even see the mother being interviewed 
um, you know, listening to her, it was terrible. And the mother explained that she was a young mom. She was 16 when she had her daughter. And so she she referred to her daughter as a friend, um, which was very interesting. And I believe they were in some of the articles I read, they referred to the grandparents as really raising um, Lizbeth. So uh, yeah, it's really, it, it's, it's beyond tragic. And yeah. I can't even imagine the horror of this mother walking in and seeing her daughter's foot and that's how she realized because the curtains from my understanding the curtains were closed and the mother saw a foot hanging over the bathtub and then she pulled the curtain and that's when she discovered her daughter in a way no parent should ever have to discover their child no no so our first case as we said is out of texas small town called edna where a mother is suffering after having found her daughter dead in the bathtub the victim here is 16 year old lisbeth medina Charged with her murder is 23-year-old Rafael Romero. Police say that he has confessed to the killing, but the question is why? Lisbeth's family says they don't know this man and they don't understand what connection there is to their family. But, of course, this case is still under investigation. The police chief told ABC 13 that Lisbeth was stabbed. Rafael Romero was arrested about an hour away at his family's home in Schulenburg, Texas. Police say they found items in his car that belonged to Lisbeth. Also, the authorities confirmed that Rafael was here illegally in the United States on an expired visa, so he's facing charges on that as well. This is Lisbeth's mother, Jacqueline Medina, talking to ABC 13. As you said, Nikki, Lisbeth was her only child. We had no enemies. We were new in the area. Nobody, nobody would, like I said, she was a sweet girl. She was loved by everybody. It's heartbreaking because here is a mother, Nikki, who's searching for some answers, trying to figure out, like, why? Why would you kill my daughter? Who would do this? And that sense of, we're new. We just moved here. My daughter is nothing but sweetness. Like, what could possibly motivate a human being to kill someone else they had just moved from nebraska about a year ago the mom worked in the renewable energy sector and it was just the two of them yeah i think uh i think not just the mother but the whole community needs answers as you said anna this is a small town this impacts all of the residents of edna so you know they all want to know why did this happen um how could this have happened and who did this and so I think that's those questions are really important, not obviously to the family, no question about that, but also to the citizens. Um, you know, we want to understand what what prompted this. And we don't know anything about, you know, whether there was a sexual assault. We don't know anything. We at least I haven't seen anything in, no. in any of the news reports. So we can't we just don't know what the motive is. Um, I believe they had a video of a man um you know that they said resembled him but i don't know if you've seen the video but i've seen the video and i to me it doesn't look like the same guy i don't know what am i seeing that that's different than the, the authorities because when i'm seeing the video it just the picture at least it doesn't look like the guy they arrested nikki i agree with you i looked at it and i'm like hmm doesn't that's look like him but you know it's possible that they have a much more detailed version of it. We don't know if someone, you know, the suspect changed his appearance here. We don't know if he's the yes. only suspect here. That's great point. I mean, I just, I, maybe it is the car that, you know, that he got into. I don't know. But just when the news kept saying that here's a picture of him and then here's the, the you know, the photo of him at, at the time of rest, I was like, this doesn't look like the same guy. Yeah, so the, the video surveillance that you're referring to, Nikki, this was uh, from December 8th. And at the time, before the arrest, because it was a tip that led to this person's arrest, they were asking for help identifying this person. And the suspect was described, obviously, as a male based on the, the video and the photo, wearing a black Volcom hooded sweatshirt, a possible tattoo behind his right ear. And then the vehicle identified was a Ford Taurus somewhere between 2010, 2018. So that was a vital part of where the authorities were going with this. And I do find it interesting that it was a tip that led police 
and the Texas Rangers to Schulenburg an hour away. So again, the question is going to be, okay, hour away, what's the connection? But we don't know the answers to that. We're, they are still obviously piecing this together. Um, we're having this discussion because if this is a random act of violence and murder that happened in a family's apartment and we don't know the motivation yet, that's the, that is very frightening in the sense that this is a small town and everyone now feels very vulnerable, Yeah, even though hard, there's been an arrest. And it's hard for me to understand because this was in an apartment. How did other people not hear any screaming, any, any commotion? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, you'd think in an apartment there would be other residents and they would have heard something. Um, and I, I at least have not seen any video or any discussion that, you know, there were ear witnesses or eyewitnesses. So I find that to be very interesting. Maybe the tip came from from one of the neighbors. I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. But it wasn't a house. It wasn't, you know, independent. It was an apartment. It, it, with other apartments around it, I, from my understanding. Yeah. So it makes sadly, no though, sense. We've yeah. seen, we have seen cases in the past where the assailant has been able um, to grab the victim very quickly and mm -hmm. silence them very quickly. But it's a good question as to did anyone hear anything? And again, this may be part of the investigation right. and for reasons of protecting um, the prosecution of this case, we may not know all those details, though, if it, if there's a, a pretrial hearing, some of that evidence may come out. Um, I want to get back to the day of the murder, because um, it was a Tuesday, December 5th, actually last Tuesday. And Lisbeth was supposed to appear in that Christmas parade with the cheer squad from Edna High School. But she never showed up. Her mom says she started texting and calling because she's standing there waiting for her daughter to be part of, you know, this parade and this um, presentation and performance. So something she's been working up for and preparing for. So very unusual for her not to show up. Incredibly unusual. So after the mother is not getting any kind of response, she goes home. And by 6.57, police were at the scene, 6.57 p.m. In an interview that the mom did with the New York Post, the mother described walking into the bathroom, as you said, Nikki. She was actually on the phone with a friend asking for his assistance to start a search party to start looking for her daughter. And that is when she saw a foot over the bathtub, but the shower curtains were closed. And when she opened the shower curtains, she saw her daughter dead, murdered in cold blood. The mother said what was interesting here is she said that her daughter still had her pajamas on, which, oh, led, which led the mother to believe the possibility that her daughter was getting ready in the morning and that the attack happened in the morning as she was getting ready for school. But then how did the school not recognize that she had been absent that day. I'm, I'm a bit confused. You know, if your yeah, child is I, absent, the school usually, you know, tries to notify a parent that the student isn't there. So correct. I'm not really sure what their procedures are at, at that school, but I imagine if with a population that small, the school couldn't have been that big, is, is would be my guess. Right. So yeah, that's interesting that I did not know that. That's news to me that she was in her pajamas. So that would indicate that this happened Early. Early. Um, I'm assuming the mother went to work. That's right. what I'm guessing. And, and what I don't know also is, you know, this Christmas parade and all these um, it was a very big deal. Now, I'm not suggesting here that everyone should be out of school that day. Um, but these are very big events. I have no idea whether she was recorded absent or not. I haven't seen any reports of that, but it's all very troubling it is well, all and the cheerleaders i mean i'm just thinking when my daughter was in cheer parades right so the cheerleaders you know they talk during the day they text during the day where are we meeting what are we doing and you know yada 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 they have these conversations so 
if she had been gone the whole day, somebody would have recognized, at least another cheerleader would have said, we haven't heard from her. We haven't, you know, we haven't talked to her. That would obviously raise a flag. So maybe she came home, put her pajamas on. I don't under, I mean, I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. But, you know, being in your pajamas would indicate that, you know, <clears throat> you're either getting, you, you just woke up. I mean, I'd be curious to know if she had her makeup on, if she had her hair done, because they always have their hair done a certain way um, for for cheer, you know, um, for cheer events. So it'd be very interesting to know, you know, if she didn't have her makeup on, she didn't have her cheer bow on and all of that stuff. Probably then this happened early in the morning before school. Just devastating. Here's what the mother, Jacqueline Medina, shared with KHOU TV. I'm lost for words. I, I don't know where to begin. Um, I just know a mother should never go through what I went through and how I seen my baby. I think we're all at a loss for words. No parent should ever have to see their child under these circumstances or, or deal with the murder of a child. Um, and especially in the manner that she was killed. Stabbing is, you know, that's a... The murder is murder, but to see your child stabbed is something that is, uh, it's, I, I can't even process that. Yeah, it's very, very violent. Very, very violent. I, I am curious about um, whether there is any connection or not with the break into the apartment earlier. Um, some reports indicate that it doesn't appear that there was forced entry in this second incident, uh, but it's unclear again. I mean, small town. Sometimes or did they people... get a key? Did they get a key in the first break in? Was there an extra key? I don't know. I'm just speculating. This is all speculative. We don't know. We don't have enough information to, to answer those questions, but these are good questions to ask, right? How did this person get into that apartment did she let the person in did they have a key um you know how did that individual get in there um without everybody hearing I'm, i would think that at this point the media would have reached out to the neighbors to you know find out did you hear anything did you see anything so yeah it's it's a bit the whole case is peculiar the whole case you know maybe when we better understand um what the motive could have been I, i'd like to know when that break in happened, you know, what was it a week or two prior when that happened? What was taken from the, the apartment? I mean, it's was there something that somebody couldn't carry out and they came back to, to take it? And did Lizbeth just, you know, uh, catch this person? I mean, who knows what happened that night or that well, the day? mother, the mother, the mother believes that they're not related, but we don't oh. know. That's just her her feeling okay um she said that in that incident the first one they had only taken small things things this is a quote from her things that i would call petty stuff because it wasn't even worth anything and that that indicates to me that they had to be able to carry it whoever broke in there had to you, you can't carry you know if you don't have a car or you don't have bags boxes you can't take a lot of stuff and you can't take big things. So when you see things that are taken that are small, petty, it means that they, they just took whatever they could that they could carry with them out of that apartment. Very strange. If, if anything, that's actually very troubling to me. A break-in in which very little, if anything of value, is taken, then I ask why what are you doing in there like what's going on yeah what are you looking for but do you think do you know that there's something in there of value that you want i mean i would be curious to, to i haven't seen a picture of the apartment building um i don't know where the apartment was was it first floor was it second was uh, I, I don't I, I really don't know but i think all those if we understood the placement of the apartment, we may better understand. Maybe if it was on the ground floor, somebody saw something and they walked in because they saw something they were, you know, they broke in because they saw something they wanted. But if it's a second or third floor, why, why that apartment? 
why that apart why that specific apartment was there something on social media posted was there a picture of of you know mom lisbeth i don't know i'm just again speculating but did somebody see something that they wanted and they were going to get it you know um i don't know i don't know but we know there are cases out there where people post things on social media and then somebody breaks in to get what, what, you know, whatever they saw, a piece of jewelry or, or I got paid today. And so they, you know, they go in to, to, to burglarize, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that home. So it's very interesting as to what prompted that initial breaking and entering. And I'm curious as to why the mother believes that they are, um, they're, they're isolated incidents. I mean, there must be a reason and maybe for her, she's thinking they didn't take a whole lot so I don't think they're coming back because maybe we didn't have a whole lot. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So just to get everyone back on the timeline. So December 5th is when she's found dead. December 8th is when that video of a potential suspect is released. December 9th, the community holds a candlelight vigil for Lisbeth and her family outside the Jackson County Courthouse. And hours after that, is when the suspected killer is arrested. So a lot of things are going on behind the scenes while this vigil is going on. And again, it was based on a tip we are told by police. Edna Police Chief Rick Boone told media outlets that he was, quote, 100% confident that Raphael was responsible for Elizabeth's killing, reiterating that he had confessed to the crime. I saw your face right there for those of you who are listening and not watching. When it comes to confessions, um, Dr. Oh. Jackson here is um, an expert in this area. What are your initial thoughts about this alleged confession? Well, I've been doing police trainings uh, on wrongful convictions and talking about false confessions and quite interesting chiefs of police have even said we didn't know that we didn't think about that so when I, you know i've been a professor for over 33 years and really in you, you mentioned that i was a domestic violence expert that's really my area until about eight years ago and now i'm very very enmeshed into this world of wrongful convictions i want justice like everybody else out there but i want to make sure they've got the right person because i don't want the wrong person sitting in prison while the right person is out there and going to commit more crimes. And we've seen that in, in unfortunately too many cases. So when I hear a chief of police say a hundred percent that that alarms me, that alarms me because I don't think in just a couple of weeks you could have done due diligence in, in your investigation. And because somebody confesses, that doesn't always mean they committed the crime. I'm not saying this guy didn't commit the crime. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. But I always am very skeptical about confessions because I want to understand how the confession was 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 um, you know was conducted. Um, what you know what were the parameters? Um, we've had people who've been interrogated for 24 hours without sleep, without food, without bathroom breaks. And yeah, they're going to confess. I'm not saying that's what happened in this case, but I also know that when, you know, I hope the public, when they hear somebody say that the person confessed, you really do some research and find out how did that confession come about? And, you know, maybe he confessed because he really committed this crime. And if he did, he absolutely deserves to be punished for what he did. But I also believe as a criminal justice professor, and, you know, I've been in this field for almost gosh, four decades, that we have to allow the system to do what it should be doing, and that is to be investigating. I have never, I, 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 in my career, I've not heard anybody say we are 100%. And when, so, when I hear 100%, that tells me that the police have ignored any other possibility of what, of you know, maybe somebody else was involved, maybe somebody else committed this. When you have one suspect that, you know, your tunnel vision, you, 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 it could lead to a wrongful conviction. Again, I'm not saying this happened, but I'm saying it has happened in the past and it's happened to far too many people. And I just wanna make sure that they have the right person and that, you know, rather than being 100% sure, be, you know, 
80% sure and continue to, to do the investigation. And I think we owe that to Lizbeth and to her family. Yes. And, and we to the have community. Seen, and to, and the, to community. the community. We have seen where um, initial confessions can get tossed out of court and yes. not be admissible in the actual prosecution of the person. And that can sometimes weaken the case if there isn't additional evidence against the person. So yeah. that's why, um, you know, I'm always, when I hear that someone has confessed, it's not that it isn't of value, but if that's the only evidence, it's going to be tricky getting a prosecution, especially if the person maybe did do it. Yeah, and, and you, you've had Jeff Deskovic on your show before. Jeff, you know, falsely confessed at the age of 16 to a rape and murder he did not commit. And he underwent hours of interrogation without an attorney, without a parent present. Um, and he had a good cop, bad cop, and he confessed to something he didn't do because he had been promised this I'm a, you're going to go home, son, if you just tell us the truth. And he ends up in prison for 16 years. And during the course of his incarceration, the real rapist, the real killer committed a crime again. I, I'm not saying in this particular case that they have the wrong guy. I just want to make sure they have the right guy. That's all. That's yeah. really what, because I, I don't want your audience to think, oh, she doesn't believe that this guy committed the crime. That's absolutely not the case. I just want to make sure that they've done their, they're continuing to do their research, not, you know, and their investigation. Of and course. You, you said it, it, it shouldn't be just a confession. Maybe they did find things in the car that they're talking about. That is a slam dunk for the prosecution. And if that's the case, then that confession probably is a valid confession, right? Mm -hmm. um, if it's- As if long as it was obtained any... legally so it can be used in court, because that's the other thing. And I would, and look, the, the police chief has said it himself. This is a small department and this was a huge case for them, overwhelming. They just, you don't have murders in Edna. So it's important to also realize that the Texas Rangers were, the state police were involved right. in this. And so um, my hope is, even if the Edna Police Department doesn't have a ton of experience in securing a crime scene and gathering uh, forensic evidence, my hope is that other agencies came in to help the police yeah. department collect that forensics, which is going to be vital to this case. Yeah, and I think it's really wise that they haven't disclosed a whole lot of information to the media yet, to, you know, to really protect their case. It's really important to the integrity of the case to not tell us everything um, because they, you know, they're, they're, if the more they share, the, you know, the more challenging it's going to be for them in, in many ways. But one way is definitely then the defense is going to start, you know, you know, start they're going to start nitpicking at all of these things that the, the state is already is claiming that they have. And I think when you have too much information out there, there's going to be a lot of and I've already seen it on social media. People want blood. They want blood, um, you know, and, and I understand that. I think as a mother, we all you know, we all want to see that the right person is convicted and goes away, you know, for a very, very long time, if not forever. This is a horrific crime that was committed against this young lady. And and I just want to make sure that, we, you know, that they have the right person. And having the Texas Rangers involved was a wise decision. I don't think that Edna police would even have the resources to conduct the investigation properly. So they've at least brought in the right folks, I believe, to investigate this case. Yeah, police have not been absolutely transparent and they don't have to be about what was allegedly found in the suspect's car, the Ford Taurus. So there were items, police say, in there that they believe were missing from Lisbeth's apartment. So we don't know what those items are, but they claim that they found those, apart those pieces uh, in his car. So that is an important piece of this investigation. Again, we do not know the motive here. Police even say they're, they don't believe, they don't believe that there was any connection between the two. 
uh, police are, are calling this crime an isolated incident. So um, they also have said that Rafael has a previous charge arrested on a burglary charge in Schulenburg, in which he later pleaded no contest to. So authorities are alleging, reportedly, that he has some history of burglary. So it's interesting, interesting they said isolated, that this is isolated. And so there's no you know, threat to the community. So when I hear it's isolated, you know, I'm thinking, was there a connection between it's specific? The, like when something yeah, isn't is right. like that, it's not like, random. It's very right. specific. So it, they're yeah. saying both things. Right. So it's, it, you know, it's it's hard for us to really figure out what, you know, what the relationship was, if any, between the victim and the the suspect right now. Mm hmm. Yeah. So the suspect here he has been charged with capital murder, booked in the, to the Jackson County Jail in Edna, being held on two million dollars bond. Nikki, I don't even have words because th there is no there is no peace. There can never truly be justice here. Elizabeth's body was transported back to Nebraska for burial. Her funeral was held on the evening of December 12th, and then she was buried the next day. There is no justice. There is no justice. Our next case is also out of Texas, but fortunately, no one here has died. This is a case of millionaires behaving badly, and apparently, maybe, maybe being held accountable, but <laughs> we still don't know whether that's so. Okay, ordinarily, when you have a 29-year-old charged with allegedly opening fire on three police officers responding to his home, that would be news enough. But now consider that this young man is really much better known on social media and around the world for his $59 million wedding. $59 million. I mean, I think a million dollar wedding is crazy, but this is like 50 times worse than that. <laughs> Almost 60 times worse. Yeah, crazy. I just honestly, you know, we'll show you some of this wedding and then you can see some of it on social media. It's just like the whole, this entire case is so perplexing and jarring because it's like two crazy extremes here. And I've never seen a wedding like this. It, this actually, like, it's beyond a royal wedding. You, you know, royal weddings are really like really big stuff. This goes beyond. This is, this is beyond that. I just, I don't even know what to make of this. Okay, the case is out of Fort Worth, Texas. And this is where 29-year-old Jacob Legrone is accused of assaulting three police officers by opening fire on them back in March this potentially could land him in prison for 25 years if he takes the plea deal being offered to him, okay? Now, for those of you who are listening, but those of you who are watching, we are now going to compare the mugshot, okay, of Jacob's arrest, and we're gonna put that side by side with Jacob at the $59 million wedding, okay? <laughs> A tale of two guys, it's one man, two stories. I, okay. Here's the thing, Mickey. Look, you have millions of dollars and you want to spend it on a crazy lavish wedding. Fine. That is your choice. You're rich. Do whatever you want. But I think what so many of us are so curious about is, will that level of power and money buy this guy out of what could be justice here? What do you think? So what we what's interesting is that this alleged crime happened in March and then the wedding is in November, right? And the judge allowed him to go to out of the country to Paris to get married. So why would you have a $59 million wedding knowing that you are facing a pretty hefty, you know, sentence possibly, right? They're offering you a 25 year um, gig in prison. But why would you still have this $59 million wedding when you might be going to prison for a very long time? I just don't get it. And it's her family who has the money, from my right. understanding. Yeah, right? she's, yeah, she, her, her dad is the one who's very wealthy. 
you know, there's a part of me that says, okay, look, the wedding may have been planned along, you know, look, if when you're spending a night at the Palace Versailles, uh, the Paris Opera House, you're doing a party, you have the Eiffel Tower to yourself, and you are visiting the house, uh, the couture houses of Dior and Chanel, you know, it takes a lot of planning to get this done. So it's possible that this wedding was already planned. I would think so. And it's very, I would think that he probably had to get uh, permission to go to, to leave the United States and go to the wedding. And they probably didn't, you know, it's like, okay, I, you know, part of me can understand that, especially if it's a first offense, although shooting at an officer sounds very, very serious to me. Three officers. Three officers. So was Three. there special treatment in allowing him to leave the country to attend this? His conditions as part of, you know, because he didn't spend really much time in jail. He bailed out in like no time, obviously. Um, you know, he's not supposed to drink or take drugs. And so all these videos that were made and went viral of this lavish wedding, um, the ones that remain available to see, you don't see him holding a drink. <laughs> mm -hmm. But but Nikki, what I don't know is, so if you go to another country, then do the terms of your release um on bail does i mean does that mean i cannot believe that the man didn't have a drink over there yeah so yeah if the judge said we're gonna let you leave the country but when you go to you know to that country you cannot drink you cannot he's got to follow the rules of of the court here um because they they you know it's not the 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 government is not you know telling him in paris what he can and can't do it's here in texas telling him we're gonna the judge is saying i'm gonna let you go but here are the the conditions and so you have to follow these or you know um i guess he face heftier sentence you know or heftier charges i guess uh, here's yeah. my thing is this look if this happened in my family i would say all right so you're very fortunate that you two kids get to go and still have your wedding. But none of this social media stuff, people. 100%. We're not making this into a massive show because all that does is going to hurt the situation of the criminal case that the groom is facing. But no, no, this family, <laughs> it, it was... It, they, I mean, the videos are extraordinary. They had Maroon 5 play at the know. reception. I've been trying to find out if, if Adam Levine has made any comments about the wedding, um, because obviously he knew about, uh, well, maybe he didn't know. I guess it's not obvious, but I would think that, you you know, that people involved with the wedding planning knew that there, this guy was over there under these conditions, right? I just can't wrap my head around this, you know, I guess people have money, you can do what you want with it, but there are so many better things you can do. And especially if you were in trouble like he is, if it was my child, I would say, let's use that money to get back to the community. Um, and, you know, you made a mistake, you screwed up, let's do something to, to, to right the community. And we have the ability to, you know, to help the homeless or whatever. I would, I, I would not, I would not pay for $59 million wedding if, you know, my future son-in-law is in this kind of trouble. I would use that money elsewhere. But to go on social media, to me, and this is just my opinion, it's a sense of entitlement that I can just do whatever I want. And I have all this money and, you know, my dad is going to, you know, my dad's wealthy and our family's wealthy and we can just do whatever we want. It was like a slap in the face to, in my opinion, to, to, to all the citizens of Texas, like what? You are gonna go out there after your fiance allegedly shoots at three officers and you're gonna go and flaunt on TikTok and whatever else. Oh my gosh, this grandiose wedding. I mean, come on, that's a, that, that is absolutely absurd. And I'm curious as to why she finally pulled it off. I don't know if he had put it on his social media, but I know she had. She so had, and then she made her account private, but the wedding planners, which are the Lake Como uh, wedding mm -hmm. planner group, they still have it up on Instagram as do some other sites. So those associated with the production of this five day event, and they do a countdown, five days to the wedding, yeah. four days to the wedding, you know, you know, and it is, I mean, and they are head to toe designer. I just, I mean, I can't, I, it's, 
it's extraordinary. It is really, when they say like the wedding of the century, I believe it. It is, look, if we were to remove the, the, poten the criminal aspect of what's going on in this couple's life, and you just look at this as a very ostentatious but beautiful wedding. I mean, we can all look and dream, but the problem is, you know, you have a serious criminal complaint here that the that the bride and groom are dealing with as a couple dealing with as a family. So I, I would not be flaunting this if, certainly if it were my son, it's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. We, we got to start being a little humble here. And at the very least, can we be a little private? Right. Right. And in the daughter, if it was your daughter, you'd be like, not are you going to marry let's this say, guy? Let's, <laughs> let's even say that there was no criminal charges against him to even flaunt that is is it's just too much it's over the top and i anybody who if even if you have that kind of money anybody who spends that kind of money um it just to me it's just it's all about me right five days there's there's a point of extremism here i mean five days so you know what's their marriage <laughs> going to look like we're, we're talking about a wedding what's their marriage going to look like oh he's going to be in prison possibly for 25 years i mean maybe focus on the marriage more than the wedding itself it, it was just too much it's too much <laughs> and if i was dad i would have I, I would not have put down but that's me i mean mm -hmm. everybody has the right to do what they want i would never have put down that kind of money and i know there's like what was he like? He owned Mercedes Benz dealerships. You have that kind of money. That's, I mean, yeah, the dad, the dad lives in Texas and um, owns a bunch of um, dealerships. Mercedes. And I guess that and all his investments, clearly they have the money to spend. So it's yeah. like, all right, fine. This is how you want to spend your money. I mean, it's sure. incredibly lavish. I mean, in the videos, I mean, you see the bride and the bridesmaids and the mom and the dad. And then you see the groom on a private plane with his parents. It's a lot going on, but I, that's I a lot. Wanna... Her change of clothes in every picture is very interesting too. I have to say, my favorite though was um, only because I thought the whole thing was so absurd. She had like what I call a crafting event at the house of Chanel. I saw that. Yeah, where pouches. They, the pouches. They're making little little Chanel pouches out of some Chanel tweed, and I'm thinking to myself, what do the French people think about this family from Texas? That's what I'm saying. They're like, really? We're crafting at Chanel? Hello? <laughs> Is this Michaels? Crazy. Michaels goes to Chanel. <laughs> so at the end of the day, are we really like, I mean, on social media, the news media, are we really that concerned about the fact that he shot at three people? Or are we just also outraged at this insanely lavish wedding? You know, some people would say, oh, people are jealous because they don't, you know, they could do this. Um, I don't know if for me, it's not jealousy. It's just it's over the top, as you said. It's yeah, over but the I don't top. really care. You know what? I don't it, care it's their money. Don't they want to flaunt it. I, I just don't think you should flaunt it. That's just me. Well, That's it me. definitely there are people was suffering. There are people it, suffering in this world. There are children who aren't able to eat. And here we are flaunting, you know, the millions and millions and tens of millions of dollars for a wedding. So ostentatious. So it's just, and the thing is usually people who with celebrity and money, like when George Clooney married a mall, like they're constantly hiding from people taking the photos yes. and they want to have a private event, no matter how much they True. spend. Good it's point. Always, it's like these two, this is not a mall Clooney. This is not a woman <laughs> who's fighting for the rights of people. <laughs> That's right. You know, around the world and for justice. <laughs> yeah, no. She's this no was mom. definitely, Nobody's... it's all about me. It's all about me. And that's oh, really unfortunate. All right, let's get back to this case because it's got some elements to it that, honestly, these are the parts that bug me. So, you know, he recently, the, the now husband, recently had a court hearing. And this, honestly, of everything that's been out there, this is the part that bugs me because the hearing was behind closed doors. Oh, excuse me, rich privileged people. Behind closed doors, okay. And, and when he showed up for this hearing, he had a bodyguard with him and he, the bodyguard is blocking the news cameras and reporters from covering this. Excuse me, a month earlier, 
<laughs> you're in Paris in front of all the cameras and you're posting everything, you know, including you brushing your teeth or whatever, right? And, but now, no, 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 no. Now you don't want the cameras. So I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. So body blocking bodyguard. You can uh, see these videos. WFAA captured this. The Daily Mail got great video. And you see the accused walking in with the bodyguard with his arms raised up and he's yelling at everybody, you know, to keep walking, keep walking. And then they go into a closed room. I mean, if I were a reporter covering this, I'd be like, who the hell are you? <laughs> Absolutely. Where did Absolutely. you come from that you have a bodyguard? I mean, Who are you? Yeah, that's just not even right. I mean, I, you said at the beginning of this uh, of this hour that I was in court this morning on a. It was actually a murder case, and there were no bodyguards. There were, you know, it was a public hearing. Everybody could be sitting there and anybody who wanted to be there could be there because that's how the justice system is supposed to be. You know, that's that's what, you know, our our, our, our rules are very clear that, it you know, trials remain public. I'm not sure why, other than maybe because they'll say the judge is saying, well, there's too much media attention on this case. So we were going to keep it closed. Um, and that's probably what happened. I don't know. But. It, there's so much media on this case because his client brought in all this media. Yeah, he they lives in front of a camera. They were advertising, right? Exactly. If you're going to live your life yeah. in front of a camera, I'm sorry, you don't really get to choose what part of it, especially with a public criminal complaint. You don't get to control it all. You know? Right. Well, I, they did. They did. Well, they did. I mean, there's they still did. video of him and he looks ridiculous, you know, with the crazy bodyguard, you know, with the arms out. I mean, come on now. This is I just wonder, yeah, with this judge, you know, I mean, you know, is he not or she, I don't even know who the judge is, but is this judge really that concerned that the public is, um, you know, that social media is going to not give this guy a fair trial? I mean, it sounds like they're going to, they, they offered him a plea, so wouldn't even go to trial. So I'm not sure, you know, maybe they, they haven't decided that he's going to accept the plea or not, but regardless. Oh, he's not going to accept this plea because the plea <laughs> is for 25 years in prison. You think he's going to accept this? Please. I know. And he's got the resources. He's got the money. Um, yeah. So, no, it's it's just crazy. But, you know, justice is really um, it's not a it's definitely not a fair, fair system. Oh, this, absolutely our not. System no. is and so that is broken. Yeah. And that is why I do believe in covering cases of the privilege, because honestly, if if it appears that they are being treated differently than someone else, then we need to scream that from the rooftops. It may not change well, anything, but I'm sorry, I'm not going to be complicit in hiding you either. I'm yeah, just, so I want to talk about the case a little bit more. So it was March 14th, and this happened at the West Worth Village Police Department. They responded to a home after multiple calls regarding a disturbance. Now, we want to be clear here. The authorities have not really said much about what that disturbance was, what was going on. That has been kept quiet. We don't know. And the families involved have not spoken and the attorneys for the families have not spoken about what led others to call the police. So we still don't know what's at the heart of that officially. So this isn't any ordinary home. It's a $1.4 million mini mansion because it only has four bedrooms. Okay. So this is a house that the bride's dad bought for the couple before they got married. Okay. So that, again, giving you perspective of money here. According to authorities, that Jacob fired on the officers when they arrived, and he was arrested on the scene. He spent no time, really, in jail. He bonded out on $20,000. Okay. twenty. That tells you what I don't understand, Nikki, is $20,000 bond. He's out immediately, but now they want 25 years in prison. I'm kind of feeling like the justice system is a little bit all over the map here. Well, when you've got that kind of money at your disposal, there, there's no amount that he couldn't have paid, right? So it wouldn't matter if they gave him twenty million or twenty thousand; he would have been able to bond out. So I, I get that. You know, the whole purpose to bond somebody out is just to ensure that they're going to come back to trial. And he's so public now that it would be hard for him—not impossible, but it would mm -hmm. be hard for him to, to you know, just, just flee. 
But um, I, I understood that um, because he can't afford whatever the judge would impose in terms of, a, of bail. Um, he'd be able to afford the bond. Okay, so he posts bond, he's arrested. Now let's go to August. In August, he's indicted. He is indicted on this criminal charge. So, you know, as we said, the bond had conditions. No alcohol, no firearms, and you have to provide urine tests. So, again, I still don't understand this whole wedding in France exemption. Okay. All right. Uh, Now, they get married. So now we're going forward, right? We're still moving here. They get married. He marries Maddie Brockway on November 18th. So he has this criminal issue hanging in the balance, but goes ahead with his huge five-day wedding, the lavish nuptials that we've already described. The father of the bride is Bob Brockway, who lives in the Fort Worth area. He owns a group of Mercedes-Benz dealerships operating in Florida. Daddy picks up the tab. Um, so what do we know about the groom? We know that the family is very, very privileged. Well, we do actually don't know a lot about this man. There's not a lot out there. Um, he's a University of Mississippi graduate who worked as a talent coordinator for the Country Music Association in Nashville in 2013 and 2014. That's what he says on his LinkedIn profile. He was a coordinating, um, I guess, producer and providing logistical support for talent on the main stage of the CMA Festival. Okay. And then he worked as the operations assistant for Ole Miss the football team, for three years and provided, quote, daily assistance to the director of football operations. Now, none of these jobs sound to me like million-dollar paychecks. Do they, Nikki? No, not at all. In fact, I was (laughs) trying to find out, like, what his family, you know, did, and it sounds like, just from what I've read on the Internet, that they didn't come from that kind of wealth, obviously. So it's her, her family, and he was marrying into money, no question about it. One very lucky individual. (laughs) I think so. Although they may, the the, the family may find that they're very lucky to get him as a son-in-law. Not for me to judge. Not for me to judge. Okay, back to the criminal complaint. So we don't know an awful lot about him, but he clearly doesn't have the money and the entree that his wife Maddie does. In the criminal complaint, prosecutors accused Jacob of, quote, intentionally and knowingly threatening imminent bodily injury to the officers. Prosecutors also noted that Jacob did use or exhibit a deadly weapon during the commission of this assault, that being the firearm, and Jacob's defense attorneys have yet to issue a statement about any of this. So no one has come out and said anything. Nobody's apologized. Nobody has said anything. So when he went to this court date with the bodyguard, he was offered a plea deal of 25 years by the Tarrant County District Attorney. If convicted, if he decides not to take the deal and if he's convicted, um, it's this sentence or the sentencing guidelines are from as little as five years and no more than 99 years. Life. Right. Pretty much Could be life. life. Yeah. Now, Probably, probably not going to be life given if we, you know, look at the crime in comparison to other crimes and what, you know, generally is going on here. I'm Nikki, is it reasonable given that it's likely a first offense that wouldn't you just ordinarily go to some kind of probation, community service, fine, or do you really think there's going to be uh, prison time here. Well, I think that the, the charges are very serious. He fired it, th- allegedly fired at three police officers. So um, if that, it, you know, if he did do that, I'm glad they actually arrested him. So that's a good thing. Privilege didn't work in his favor because he was arrested. Um, you know, they could have um, just left and they didn't. They took this guy in custody. Um, I think You know, I hope that whatever sentence he's given, that it's going to be fair. I don't know what fair would look like. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what his criminal history is. I don't know 
Um, I don't have a crystal ball. None of us do. Will he commit something, you know, some crime like this again? I think it's interesting because I didn't know this before you, you spoke that there were conditions about the alcohol. Um, you know, was he drinking when the this allegedly, you know, occurred? I have no idea. Um, I I think it, it must have been pretty serious. I mean, yep. we're talking also Texas, where they are pretty tough on crime. Yeah. So you fire at three officers. Thank God he didn't hit any of them. Yes, thank agreed. God Absolutely. That. You know, thank God. That's that what that I mean. Happened. No one was injured. So, thank God. Thank God for that. But I want to know more about what happened. And I don't I, we don't have that. At least I don't have that information. You know, what happened when the officers got there? Did he just start firing the minute they approached the front door? Was there an altercation and he grabbed a gun allegedly and started shooting? I just don't know. And I think you have to before you can really and talk about a sentence, even a charge, you have to understand all of the factors of what, what took place. Um, nobody ever should be firing at police officers. No, you know, it just should not be happening. Um, it's so, you know, without even knowing all the facts, he, unless they were firing at him and he's not a bad guy, then, you know, then you fire back. If he's not a bad guy and somebody's trying to kill you, that's self-defense. But that's not what this was at all. This was it. It doesn't sound like at least. Well, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, it'll be curious to to hear what, what happens to this guy. But I think that, that they were foolish. I think they this is just my opinion that they used poor judgment in, you know, using social media to to really boast what privilege they have. And Anna, you said it so well. Then when the, you know, then he goes to court for his hearing. Now the cameras are off. You know, we only want the public to see this good, this money we have. But here's, you know, here's the other side of, of you know, Jacob that we, 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 we haven't seen. And to have this bodyguard, you know, standing in front of him, protecting his identity, it's that should never, in my opinion, that should never have happened. It doesn't happen with the other inmates. I sat today in court and watched inmates walking in with handcuffs in their jail scrubs. You know, do they get the same privilege that, you know, that Mr. Legrone got? No, they don't. And, and that was privilege inside a court right. building. Right. These are public hallways. I mean, even when celebrities are arrested and yes. they are charged with crimes... I'm, they don't get to bring their bodyguards yeah. into the building for a hearing. It doesn't work that way. Who in the world are you that you get to bring in a bodyguard into a public building to defend you? Oh, Listen, please. Oh, prosecutors please. and defense attorneys don't even have bodyguards. And their and they lives are often placed and they into get, danger. And they right? get threats. And they yeah, get threats. They get so threats. Please. Prosecutors get threats and they're not walking around with bodyguards. It is time for our comment section. These are the crime cases you all are talking about on social media. Here's our producer, Will Updike. Hey, Will. Hey, how's it going? Good. Good to see you again, Nikki. Good to see you. Um, so this one, Anna, you were actually pretty excited about. We have a case of some some fast food justice uh, or not justice. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later. People had some kind of differing opinions on this one. But this case comes out of Parma, Ohio, where a judge has offered an alternative punishment for a furious fast food patron facing jail time after hurling a burrito bowl at a Chipotle employee. Um, this incident dates back to September of this year uh, when Parma police uh, responded to a location of the popular chain for reports of a dispute between an employee and a customer. Now, the customer and now convicted here, Rosemary Hain, ordered a burrito bowl, pretty standard order there at Chipotle, and was reportedly upset with the quality. Now, this is the first part where I take pause, because what does that mean? You're upset with the quality. You haven't tasted this yet, but, you know, so you're unhappy with the way that it looks. Probably you're, a skimpy bowl is what I'm thinking. I mean, that would make sense, too. Like, you're unhappy with the quantity of food in the bowl. I'm not I'm just not really sure what that means. So anyways, <clears throat> Rosemary here asked an employee who also happens to be the manager. Just want to note that as well, too. They, they're the manager in this situation. They uh, Rosemary asked her to remake the bowl. No problem. Manager remakes the bowl. Problem solved, right? Yes. Apparently not. After leaving the restaurant, Rosemary apparently walks back in, asking the manager to make the burrito bowl again for a third time. 
Manager no longer having it. They refused this. This was a step too far. Uh, and Rosemary then hurled the full size bowl of food at the employee. And no, <clears throat> no not OK. Not, not okay. okay. And 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 I want to say, like, just so people get the picture, this this wasn't like a one sided. In, this wasn't an interaction where, you know, the, the manager had necessarily done anything to provoke this. As soon as this happened, other customers in the restaurant, pro- which was probably the reason she didn't want to make the bowl again, was there's a bunch of customers in this restaurant. But as soon as the bowl is thrown they're they're screaming at this woman, telling her, like, get out of the restaurant. Like, you have to get out of here. Like, what are you doing? This is so insane. Um, so after the assault, Rosemary leaves the Chipotle. Uh, in her car before police show up on the scene. But one of these customers uh, did take down her license plate information, which led them to a apartment address. So police are are talking to the manager here. She apparently has some swelling on her face. She denied medical treatment. You know, obviously it's a burrito bowl. It's not the it's it's not the end of the world from a like a hurt uh, or injured uh, standpoint. But she was like covered in sauce injury. It's absolutely respectful. Yeah, no, she was covered in in sauce uh, and and, like really shaken up by the whole incident. So, like I said, police are able to track her down with this license plate information. Rosemary is charged with assault and disorderly conduct, but prosecutors ended up dropping the disorderly conduct charge uh, when Rosemary pleaded guilty to the assault charge. So Rosemary stood in a court. She apologized to the court and the victim. Um, but just kind of a weird side note here. It seems like maybe she didn't completely learn her lesson because she also justified her behavior in this apology saying, oh, no. If- This is a direct quote. If I showed you how my food looked and how my food looked a week later from that same restaurant, it's disgusting looking. So maybe this is her idea of what a quality control issue is. It's more of an aesthetic thing, what the bowl looks like. I got to be honest with you. You are mixing that bowl up. It does not matter what it looks like. It really like if you've ever had a Chipotle bowl, if you're there for aesthetics, you're probably at the wrong place. I'm so sorry. And that's not a knock on Chipotle. It's just it, a burrito. A burrito bowl is what it is. It's exactly what it sounds like. That's what it's going to look like. A quality fast food restaurant. But come on, lady. Absolutely. So <clears throat> we, we we have uh, Rosemary here still kind of defending her actions. The judge in the sentence sentenced Rosemary to 180 days with 90 days suspended. Um, and the judge also, this is why we're getting into this conversation here is the judge also offered Rosemary 60 days credit on the jail time. If she worked at a fast food restaurant for 20 hours a week for about two months. And the judge said their intention in this was basically like, instead of having the County, you know, pay to, to house and feed this suspect for a while, maybe she would learn more of a lesson if, oh, if, absolutely. She, if, if she was in this situation. Um, and Rosemary reportedly told news outlets that she did plan to get a job. Now, I, I just want to talk about this a, a little bit because I, I think that the, the idea is a good idea here, but I, I, I gotta, we got to talk about the victim a little bit here too, who left her job after this incident. She was, like shaken up by it, felt so disrespected, did not want to be in this position ever again, left the Chipotle, no longer there, new place. Uh, she talked to news outlets after this sentencing and and thought it was a bit of a slap on the wrist, to be honest. Um, mm-hmm. So there's definitely like two two views here going on. And so I, I wanted to, to see what people had to say about that. Fisher of Men agreed with this. They were on board. They said, finally, an appropriate sentence. Um, Loho ag- agreed. They thought they may- maybe there could be some additional justice here saying, I really want her to get a customer that acts exactly how she did. Yes. Um, yeah, which that's the idea, right? I, I, I am of the- to teach someone some humility and compassion for the person that you have injured to understand. Yeah, and I really think that this is this is one of those things that should probably we, look. Nikki, we we cover a lot of fast food crime in this segment, and you really, what it boils. To my class. You should come <laughs> to my class because my students work. Uh, many of yes. them work fast food, yeah. and they have also endured in my victimology class. We just talked about this. You know, students who've had, worked at KFC and they've had mashed potatoes and coleslaw thrown in their faces through the drive-through. I mean, it's. It's crazy. I, it's uh, this is this is uh, it seems like it's becoming a trend where, you know, people, customers are disgruntled and they take it out on these servers. It's terrible. So it's terrible. Real. It's awful. And my, well, I guess my thing is, is like this should probably this should maybe be a thing before it ever gets to this point. Right. Like I, I've always been of the opinion that I think that everybody should work a customer service job, wh- whether yes. that's like food service, whether that's, you know, like a, uh, a a call center or whatever. Like you you should work a customer facing job 
just to be a normal part of society, just to understand, like, so you understand like all facets of stuff and like what is appropriate behavior and what isn't. And I'd like to say that that isn't required, um, but it just seems like it apparently is. Uh, so um, Complex C uh, wasn't as happy with the sentence. They said, I don't want her making my food, especially if she throws it at me. Um, and this comment, I, I, I kind of agree with uh, Athanasius said, so the judge is saying that working at Chipotle is the equivalent of being in jail. That's so a good what point too. Well, and they added, so what did the other fast food workers do to deserve their punishment? And I see this part of it, too, because yeah. I, I think from a certain standpoint, especially if I was the the manager in this situation who, like, ended up leaving my job, like, this is jail to you? Like, the, like to, you know, to the judge, like, this is the equivalent of jail to you? Um, I, I could see that as being as being pretty insulting. Right. Um Romeo L. had the, the funniest comment of it all. They kind of saw this as a weird application process. They said, you threw a burrito bowl at someone, you're hired. Um, and it, it's unclear to me, like, what would happen in this scenario if Rosemary gets the job? Like, is she does she still draw a wage from this? I, she I shouldn't. Don't, she absolutely yeah. shouldn't. No. I wouldn't think so. But then, like, where does the money go? I, oh, you know, it should go into she gets the victims. money. She gives it back to the victim. Right, yeah. victim or victim's assistance? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean that makes that makes total sense. She to me. should that not total be paid for this. This is part of her penance. One hundred percent. Yeah. Oh, what a, I love this case. I really do because it really makes us think about what is justice, which we always question. And Will, you brought up such a great point. I mean, we cannot send a message that working in Chipotle and working in fast food is a punishment. You know, because yeah. that's not right. That that's it's, it's fascinating. I, I don't know what the right answer is. Whatever no, makes uh, this woman realize that what she did was wrong yeah. and disrespectful, and that she needs to change her ways. Absolutely, yeah. And like I said, I mean, hopefully this does the trick. But if that sentencing statement that she made was any indication, like I feel like she's completely missed the net on like what yeah. what transpired here and and why she is in the wrong in this situation, which. I don't know if twenty. I don't know if twenty hours a week for two months is going to be able to fix. But hey, it's it's something. It's better than nothing. Um, but that is going to do it for that week's com for this week's comment section. Thank you so much to everybody who who chimed in on that one. Definitely an interesting story. Um, you can always leave those comments over on our YouTube community page. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the usual places. Uh, but until next week, that'll do it, and I'll see you later. We have a programming note before we say goodbye. We want to make sure to remind everyone that the season finale of Good Cop, Bad Cop is coming up. Um, it, you know, this is a really fascinating show. It's basically looking at police departments investigating that the actual criminal in the case was a police officer or a former police officer. So it's a very interesting take on crime. And uh, it's this show which is on investigation discovery features veteran homicide detective gary mcfadden and um you'll be able to see this on sunday december 17th uh, 10 p.m 9 central on id and the reason we want to mention this is because we did a great interview with Gary. And we have that episode of the podcast coming up over the holidays. It's a great interview. He's a sheriff now. He's I can't wait to, I can't. He's fascinating. Wait. He's I just a fascinating wait. guy. Um, just a, just one of those people who really always has stayed connected with all of the families he's worked with. It's just that kind of a soul. So if you're, I, I think it'd be a, a, a great episode to watch. It's the final one. So we wanted to make sure to let you know about Good Cop, Bad Cop on Investigation Discovery and our upcoming episode over the holidays. Nikki, thank you so much. Always good to spend time with you, hear your perspectives on life on criminal justice. Uh, where can people follow you? Because you're always up to something working really hard in the community. Yeah, so I'm really bad with social media. As we've been talking about social media. I'm so busy. Um, people can just Google me, uh, Nikki Jackson, and they'll find all the handles I have. And, um, you know, I don't post a whole lot. So people won't, other than Facebook, which my daughter tells me is for the older people. It um, is. <laughs> but I, that's what I keep hearing. I just don't have a lot of time bandwidth to handle social media. So, but people can always email me at cjpa 
at pnw.edu. Um, if they have any questions, um, they can always email me at that email and I'm happy to answer any questions. And Anna, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to spend the last hour and a half with you. I always enjoy talking to you. You're amazing. Oh, thank you. We think the world of you, Nikki, and all of the good work that you do helping people. And it's always appreciated. And your insight is always appreciated. You can find me at Anna Jean News on all social media. I mostly post about rescue dogs these days because oh. I, I got a cleanse. I love the sweater. Love oh, it. Oh, I know, I've right? Been... Isn't it cute? I oh got my gosh, Marshalls. I've been staring at it. Yes, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I have a little beagle from Marshalls. I Not plugging it. Marshalls, but I'm just saying, you know, that's where the bargains are. Marshalls, TJ Maxx, right? <laughs> and love Ross. it. Love it. <laughs> you know where to find me in social media at one of those stores <laughs> or at the outlet mall. <laughs> Um, you we can need find to shop this together. Yes, it's my life. Um, you can find this episode, all episodes, wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Go to our website. Subscribe to the newsletter. Until next week, this is True Crime Daily, the podcast. I'm your host, Anna Garcia, and as we always say, don't do crime. <laughs>